Well, right now we have our staff reading. So please welcome Preetha Bhattacharya. Okay, can you hear me? Whew. Okay, I can hear me. Um, Thank you so much, Leah, Adam, and Gwen, for giving me the opportunity to come back to Sewanee and to my fellow staff and now new friends for welcoming me in so enthusiastically. I'm going to read sections from the second half of a story called Surrogates. And what you need to know is that the narrator, his name is Neil, um, was outed as gay in front of his parents after they found him kissing a boy in a Tesla. Um, <laughs> And he is soon dumped and begins his freshman year at Princeton, where he tries relatively unsuccessfully to find a place for himself. So I'll read from Princeton, and it'll sort of be excerpted onward. Surrogates. Art history is a last minute edition. The lecture hall is large, and the professor speaks so softly, you have to glance over at the notebook of the guy sitting next to you. He hasn't written anything down. Rather, he sketched miniatures of each of the 20 paintings that have been covered in the last half hour. What the, you think, squinting at a Thumbelina-sized replica of Fabriano's adoration of the Magi 1423? But you said it out loud, and when the guy turns to look at you, smiles when he sees what you're gaping at, you swear you've never seen such a beautiful brown boy in your whole goddamn life. Everyone's out here looking at photographs of Michelangelo's David, while a perfect specimen of a man sits right in their midst. You figure you must have done something pretty extraordinary at some point in your life because by some good karma, you and Praveen Kapoor get paired to work on the class project together. Does anything stand out to you, he asks at the museum a few weeks later. Why is this an assignment, you ask, pretending to be bored? Neil, come on, this whole class is bull. Take any painting anywhere in this museum. One day the professor will tell you what it supposedly means. Come back a week later and I'll guarantee everything she says then will be entirely different. And here I was, thinking it was your major, afraid of offending you. Art history? Nah, I'm a business snake, Praveen says entirely seriously. And what about you, mister? I want to be a doctor, thought he'd breeze through. You shrug. But that's what you're thinking. How did you even know I'm pre-med? Oh, please. At some point, you find the South Asian art, more so than the paintings, the sculptures, or what simultaneously draw you in and throw you off. You really don't know if you should say it, but... Who'd have guessed our ancestors just thought about sex all the time, Praveen asks. It's true, the men with tapered waists, tree-like limbs, the women with their perfectly round breasts, their sultry poses, fish-shaped eyes, not to mention all the phallic paraphernalia. You encounter a statue of Indra and read Sage Gautama upon discovering Indra's lust for his wife, cursed Indra to bear a thousand female marks. Years later, he adjusted the punishment, replacing them all with eyes. Did you know this, you ask? Praveen comes over, shakes his head. You notice his body is much too close, his left shoulder just behind your right. Before you leave, you browse the gift shop. Look, Praveen says, as the two of you are walking out. In his hand, he holds a postcard of the little Indra statue. He gives it to you. You continue playing these games, continue meeting unnecessarily for your project. Let me show you some real art, Praveen whispers in your ear one evening. He takes you to your first drag show. For each queen who performs, you admire her pure womanliness, the breastplates, the artificial curves, her posture, her walk. Didn't you like it, he asks, after it ends, the both of you standing outside, passing a cigarette back and forth. I didn't say that. He sighs. It was nice seeing them so comfortable on stage, though I certainly can't say the same for you, man, he says with a grin, nudging your shoulder. I've had my fair share of being in the spotlight, you reply. Before you know it, you're telling him about how you inadvertently came out to your parents. When you finish, he bursts out laughing, but almost immediately dons a serious expression. You have a better story, you ask? He shakes his head. I'm just thinking about how relieving it must have been to finally have them know, and I'm sure they didn't take it well. They never do, but it happened without you even having to think about it. And isn't that how the most important things happen to us anyways, without us even knowing they're happening? You don't reply. Instead, you stare ahead at the passing cars, listen to the muted sounds radiating out of the club. In your periphery, you watch Praveen lift his arm and feel his palm stroke the back of your head. Suddenly, you grab the back of his neck and you kiss. Then you go back to your dorm room and you fuck, and all you can think to say but don't is, is something happening. But the next morning, he's gone, though you don't realize how gone until three days later, like no Facebook, no replies to your texts or calls, nada, no Praveen in art history. Did he drop the class just because of you? No Praveen in your life, period. Of course, he is actually there. You see him in the academic buildings, in the dining halls, in the libraries, but in relation to you, 
Drop him, proclaims your roommate. In prepping for your med school interviews, you learn to tiptoe the line between caring professional and assertive dick. Define success in less than 10 words, the roommate says, as you pace the living room, the intersection of opportunity and hard work. <laughs> okay, I see you. He reads off the paper again. How do you handle failure? A question you can't quite answer. Luckily, M Mount Sinai doesn't ask that of you, and they accept you. The first two years of med school can aptly be described as a slide leading you down and its sequel toward a dark bottomless pit. Do you ever cry as a med student? You'd like to say no if you cry for one person, then why not the next? But it happens one's third year in your ER rotation. A boy comes in about 14, kicked out of his home, lives in a boy's shelter, in for a rabies vaccine because a pack of neighborhood dogs bit him and ran away. You hear this all from the nurse, though. He doesn't speak to you, wants only what he's come for and nothing more. When you prod a bit, ask a few questions, he lashes out. Leave me the fuck alone. The sutures you give him are small, perfectly even. It's not the anger that gets you, but the loneliness. In OBGYN, there are no such cases. In fact, you tout in your residency interviews, it's the only specialty in which you are creating a life rather than saving one, the only specialty in which, if you consider life as cyclical, you always get to start the circle. They seem to like that. Later, you wonder about your answer. If life is cyclical in nature, then by saving a life, aren't you just slowing down the progression toward the end of the circle? At the end of the circle, don't you end up at the same place you began? You wake up one morning after three years of residency, two years of fellowship, just as many working years to pay off your student debt, and two years in your own New York City IVF clinic. To a huge snowstorm outside, by the time you step into the office, you're about three consults delayed, so you throw yourself into the clinic, kamikaze style, ready to make babies. At the end of the morning, you forget to check the name on the next file before meeting the third couple. You notice the woman first. It's almost as though your brain registers Praveen in one half and this woman in the other. Reasons for them to be here together, you can't quite compute. You handle it well, introduce yourself, go through the motions of shaking hands and opening up the patient file like a little wind-up toy. What you learn, the woman's name is Meetha Kapoor, so they are married, together for three years. Three, trying forever. <laughs> You'll do some tests starting today, you say, after performing her physical. The both of you, I'll call with results. You're almost out of the fire, about to order blood work for Mitha and a semen analysis for Praveen when Mitha calls out your name again. Dr. Chowdhury, I'm sorry to take up more of your time. You don't need to apologize. It's just, we've been to so many clinics, everyone says you're one of the best, and, well, my husband has invested so much into this, I couldn't bear seeing his face if... You wish there was something annoying about her, a rude personality, an overbearingness, a large nose, but unfortunately, you like her. Unexplained infertility you state at their next visit. You explain the next logical step. Meet has no frozen eggs left in storage, so another retrieval at the very least. Best to keep it all fresh. An ICSI to follow for sure. You mime out the procedure, the single lucky sperm very precisely pipetted into petri dish eggs, the probability of conception, transfer of the hopefully fertilized egg back into the uterus five days later. Praveen's face is overwhelmingly in your line of sight. And then he asks, and then we'll see what happens. After they leave, you congratulate yourself. You tell yourself you've always been over him. You don't think about him again until the next morning when a nurse gives you your messages. There's really only one that stands out. You practice your doctor voice, your professional voice. You practice gesticulating, although there's no one there to watch you. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. It's the first thing he says when he picks up. You with your streak of pride, but really your pettiness, reply with, what can I do for you, Mr. Kapoor? Is that how this is gonna go? When he finally comes to your office, at the end of the day, he takes you right there on your doctor desk. Afterwards, you both sit on the floor, door locked, blinds down, an angry red line coursing down your neck where his teeth have been. I knew, Praveen says suddenly. Before we came in, I knew one day I was Scrolling through referrals and Google reviews to clinics, and there you were, your name, your photograph with that stupid smirk. I just about did a double take. He sighs deeply. My first thought was to forget about it, but of course that didn't happen. Do you care for her, you ask? Because in the small part of your mind that's not selfish, you hope he does. Does it matter? Think about a potential child. Look, you don't get to judge all right, you don't know what it's like not to even have a say in the matter, to one day arrive at your parents' house at their invitation and find a girl and her family presented to you. Here you go, your new life. What could I have done? You could have told them no. And have it happen again and again, is that it? You could have told them. Praveen laughs, a resigned, hollow sound. That I could have. 
In the weeks that follow, he comes back to you, always your apartment, of course. Whenever he arrives, it's as though you can't talk to each other until after, and when you do, it's about mundane things. What did your boss say today? What happened with patient X, the one who... One evening, while you're both still in bed, but before Praveen heads home, he discovers the postcard with the Indra statue in the top drawer of your bedside table. You still have this. You try to snatch it out of his hand, but he keeps it from your reach. You try harder, and he jumps out of bed, laughing. He motions as though to run out of the room the minute you try and get up. But you don't try. After a few moments, his smile fades. He tosses the card onto the bed, and you both stare at it. It isn't fair, you exclaim. Whether you mean to me that or to yourself, you cannot say. There are ten good follicles in the morning of Mita's retrieval, ten possibilities. The nurse calls you out of the room just as you're finishing up. It's Mr. Kapoor, she tells you. He wants to speak with you. When you enter the exam room, you see him pacing around. His face is taut, his left hand grasping the specimen cup. I can't, he says to you. I can't. His belt is unbuckled, trousers slack. You shut the door behind you. What are you talking about? Meet this face flashing in your mind. What about your wife? But he keeps going. You step into his path of motion, but he walks around you and continues on. He tries to shake you off when you grab his arms, but you hold tightly. I can help you, you whisper in his ear. What follows, his frame stooping down, your mouth meeting, your one hand unzipping his pants. He is hard, and when he finishes, the cup trembles in his hand. He holds it out, and when you don't take it, places it on the counter. He turns away. Don't. Don't what, he asks, flipping around on his heel, grabbing you. He rests his forehead on your left shoulder, and the pressure makes you inhale. But then the moment passes, and he straightens. It's time for us to let this go. As he walks out, his figure blurs in your vision, then Praveen once more, a decade younger, standing by a kitchen window, stroking your chest, and calling you beta, a term of endearment reserved for mothers and fathers, meaning son but still gone the next morning. And now you are shaking, your non-dominant hand pushing hard against the wall, a new cup in your fingers and your anger toward him suspended, puppet-like, dancing above your head. You grip your erection tightly and stroke, trying hard with each passing second to let go. The day of the transfer, the embryologist tells you the news of the 10 retrievals, there's one good embryo. One chance, you tell Mitha that morning. You put on gloves, position the catheter. Before you insert it, you look up at her. Her eyes are closed, palms clasped tightly together in prayer. And although you stopped praying years ago, you feel a sense of reverence as you quietly bow your head and continue, acutely aware of all the things you could say but don't, and all the things that you could potentially begin. A few weeks later, she returns. She tries to wear a serious expression, but every couple of seconds smiles widely, betraying herself. You invite her into a clinic room. As you first draw her blood, bandage her arm, have her don a gown for the ultrasound she's calling Praveen. I don't know what's taking him so long. He said he was on his way. Praveen, where are you? Call me back. You squeeze out the jelly, position the wand. You reposition, and suddenly, Praveen is in the doorway, red-faced and panting, then reaching out to her, kneeling on the floor, embracing her while you say, here pointing to the screen with your gloved finger, your voice a croak, Mitha crying, repeating, how beautiful. Yes, how beautiful, you say softly, your wand held slackly against Mitha's stomach, Praveen placing his palm next to it and catching your eye, sitting between you, everything that has come before and everything that is to follow. Thank you. And up next. <laughs> Up next, please welcome Shelby Knoss. Okay, um, thank you, Leah and Gwen and Adam and all of the staff. I really hate this, but I love it here and it feels like a massive honor to read with all of you. Um, okay. So I'm going to read just two poems. Um, I've spent a lot of time this summer trying to figure out how to write about my family and how to write about home, so these are two attempts at that. Um, and the first is a Sistina that doesn't have a title. I'm really nervous. Um, Okay. We've got somewhere to be and we'll take whatever is running. So I've flown back home, and though I've never brought a man, my mother claims she spent the long weekend under a car and believes it can body the distance. 
which is all to say I've brought my beloved. As we cross the distance of the bridge that spans the Missouri, we take turns describing our flight to my father. Quick, no turbulence, the car breathing a low hum beneath the rattle of luggage, AC running against the June heat, and the voice of a radio host who claims the next song up, an ode to those who fought for our freedoms. I'm home for only a day, and my beloved has done his homework. He points to the stadium in the distance and begins to talk baseball, claims he wishes we had time to stay for a game, while from the back, I take stock of the changes. Interstate construction, the liquor store running a Veterans Day special, then my father veers to the exit. The car, the car slowing to the in-town limit, past the Sonic, the high school, the boxcars of freight stalled in the rail yard where my father works. But we're home today, so he's taken time off from his hours spent running down the clock to retirement. It's the day shift now, but the distance, he says, never seems to grow smaller. He sometimes takes pictures of train car graffiti and texts them to my family. He never claims to be lonely, but what we claim in this family seldom says more than that which we don't. The car we are in is not the car we'll be driving, but I take what I can get from my father. Nearly home, I ask him instead to keep driving down Broadway. In the distance, the main strip is quiet, but today the meter isn't running. So he drives us past the library, the bank, the bar where he worked, running food and fell in love back of house with my mother, still claims she made the first move. My beloved laughs. The distance from those days is as loose as the wheel they are chasing. My father says the car is in good shape. My mother spent the weekend under the hood. Once we're home, they'll pack cables in the trunk and take it out around the block one last time, make sure it's running okay, that the car we'll be driving has a full tank of gas and can take us the distance from home to wherever we decide to stake our claim. Okay, this next one is um, pretty long, so sorry about that. Um, it is um, after a poem called Asante by Mount Miller, um, and it is about Roseanne, the comedian, and also the TV show, which I was really obsessed with um, when I was young because it was my first experience of um, seeing a family or a life on TV that felt reflective of my own in terms of being really um, just messy and, um, yeah. Um, and another note is that I've always been obsessed with this and in the era of reboots that we've sort of come into, there was a Roseanne reboot um, and in that reboot, Roseanne was a Trump supporter. Shortly after that, um, was canceled for being a huge racist, and so this poem is just trying to grapple with those two facts. Um, so this is called Roseanne. Roseanne, I'm writing this tired. As a kid, I once woke in the middle of the night with my chin in my hands, my eyes dry and fixed to the screen were already open. Roseanne, I'd been watching a Roseanne marathon. I was raised on TV. Roseanne, I don't remember having a bedtime. My dad worked nights and my mom would lock herself in her bedroom exhausted. Roseanne, my mom like you was the, was the matriarch. Roseanne, my mom was a janitor. She cleaned the church up on Frank Street and would pay me $5 to oil pews and vacuum the cafeteria. Roseanne, post-service coffee should be canceled. The congregation stayed late and stopped sprinkles from the donuts into the fibers of the carpet. Roseanne, I could go on and the rest of my life without seeing another donut. Roseanne, I'm a celebrity too, was a guest on The Ellen Show as a child inventor. Roseanne, they flew us to LA and we stayed in a hotel where my parents couldn't afford to buy breakfast. Roseanne, my dad walked miles and returned an hour later with a liter of Sunny D and a half dozen glazed donuts. Roseanne, I will never forget it. Roseanne, my mother hates donuts. Roseanne, my mother like you cannot fake it. Roseanne, I should note that my father's no saint but I think we can agree that the show, this poem, is primarily the story of a mother, her sister and daughters. Roseanne, I will never have children. Roseanne, I live in New York now with my sister like a couple of spinsters. The fires up north have clouded the city in a shade of orange that Roseanne, you can only imagine. Roseanne, I was always Darlene. Long curly hair, perpetually grounded. I tortured my sister whose body blossomed before mine. 
We shared a room with twin beds and a lamp that responded to clapping. Roseanne, I'll let you imagine the rest. Roseanne, I once pushed her so far, she pulled back her arm through a fist at my jaw and I fell to the floor of our hallway. Roseanne, our parents said I probably had it coming. Roseanne, I had it coming. <laughs> Roseanne, my sister was more of a Becky, kinder, more responsible. When we'd wrestle with our dad and he'd jokingly ask if we were tough or taffy, my sister would always choose taffy. Roseanne, I've got a bone to pick with Becky. Devoting her life to a deadbeat boyfriend, I feel certain she'd have made it through college. Roseanne, my sister was the first in our family to make it through college. Before that, boarding school. Roseanne, I went too, and my parents went deeper into debt. Roseanne, I nearly failed out and only got A's in English. Once, I was walking to class and crossed paths with my sister's boyfriend. Roseanne, he pretended to go in for a hug and proceeded instead to unclasp my bra through the back of my shirt. Roseanne, she dumped him her first year of college. Around the same time, the girls in my hallway gathered in the common room at 4 a.m. and did crunches while they streamed the royal wedding. Roseanne, I watched you in secret when I should have been doing my homework. Roseanne, I sometimes dream I'm sitting at the desk in the third floor room where I often imagined my body swinging from a rope in the stairwell. Roseanne, in the dream, it's the end of the term and I've never once made it to math class. Roseanne, I made it through school. Roseanne, my parents couldn't have afforded to ship back my body. Roseanne, I'm medicated now. I watched you in secret when I should have been doing my homework. Roseanne, I didn't miss home, but missed relating to something like it. Roseanne, you were greedy for wanting a reboot. Roseanne, the reboot contradicted the end of the series as you left it. Roseanne, Darlene would have stayed in Chicago. Roseanne, Roseanne would have called it a cop-out. You might have imagined Lanford, but I swear it's the town I grew up in. Roseanne, I see now my faith was flawed. Roseanne, yesterday your president was, was indicted. Roseanne, maybe that was never the way it could end. Roseanne, you got something right that last season. The way that Roseanne, in a state of desperation, reimagined a life in which her husband lived and they went on to win the lottery. Roseanne, I understand Roseanne had to write her way into another reality. Roseanne, I understand the power of fiction. But Roseanne, I'm still waiting for the punchline. The last time I was home, I woke up to a piece of cat shit left at the foot of my bed, and the toilet only worked if you turn the water on and then off again. Roseanne, please just tell me the punchline. Roseanne, my family has a Powerball pool. Ten bucks a pop, and we each get to choose a number. Always 36, for the number of times you salted your food beside your fictional husband's hospital bed. Roseanne, is that the punchline? Thank you. Please welcome Alyssa Connerman. Hi. It uh, is always very different getting up here from giving announcements and then reading. Every year I'm like, I'm up there all the time, it's fine. And then I get up here and it is not. Um, thank you for, um, you know, you all know staff, I love you all. If I could uh, go through an unsuspecting wormhole into a different universe every summer with anyone, it'd be y'all. Um, Adam, Gwen, thank you so much for everything you do during the year to make this fun and so much easier for us. Leah, thank you for everything. Most importantly, for letting Sakina and me continue to give completely unchanged announcements up here twice a day. It's fun. Um, I, uh, my first summer on staff was, this is my third year, so 2021, and after Holly's craft lecture, I figured out something in a story that I had been working on. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna revise it and then I'll make myself read that. And then last summer I was like, I'm gonna make myself write something new. And then doing that twice, I was like, oh, this is a pattern now. And which is just like a really cool thing to do to yourself. <laughs> like I'm gonna go work at this conference and write something um, in three days that I have to read to people. So here we are. Um, this comes out of a conversation that Kaki and I had at the French house the other night talking about Petfinder, the website that I am assuming you all are familiar with. 
Um, if not, this is not going to make any sense. Um, but talking about it as far as, you know, even when you have a dog or you can't adopt a dog or cat or animal of preference, the getting on there and scrolling and not just being so much of like, oh, that animal's cute, but like you're fantasizing these different lives that you could have with each dog. So working title of this is a semiotic reading of PetFinder.com. Banjo, male, beagle mix, four years old. Banjo has been a delight for his foster family. Banjo is the kind of dog with his playful spirit and his zest for cuddling that makes you immediately wonder how you ever lived without him. With Banjo, you will no longer sneer when people use the cliche about making a house a home because you will now truly understand what home feels like. Update, foster family confirms Banjo is gentle and calm with small children and tolerates change well as his foster mom just brought home a baby girl. But that will never matter for you, Liz, now will it? Millie, female, pit boxer mix, two years old. After a tough start to life, Millie has gone from anxious to angel in her time with her foster family. Millie will make you believe that you too can crawl out of your current hole. But Millie only needed a soft bed and some good kibble, not an out-of-network therapist that your insurance won't touch. Taco, male, chihuahua mix, five years old. Taco is bringing neurotic back. When Taco snaps, people think it's cute. And not in the polite, pitying, just trying to escape this interaction way you're used to. In the way that they're cheering for him, the nine pound underdog yapping to make his opinion known. Taco is the kind of dog who knows how to draw boundaries, even with his mother. You could learn from Taco. Taco would be a great teacher for you. But if you adopt Taco, everyone, oh God, especially Kieran, can you imagine? We'll all comment about how like you are, but only after Taco does something truly deranged. And this will depress you both so badly that the rescue will demand you relinquish him. Lucy, female, super mutt, two years old. Lucy will make you the kind of person who goes to bed and wakes up on a consistent schedule, who can't wait to get going with your day. The produce guy in the corner will know you and will start keeping dog treats on hand to give one to Lucy whenever you pass. She will make you the kind of person who casually chats with strangers without slipping into debilitating self-doubt and social unease. You'll smile like she smiles, goofy, glad, carefree, loved. Clementine, female, Boston Terrier, six years old. With Clementine in your life, Nicholas will come back. He will realize the things you needed and never said. He will take responsibility for the ways things fell apart in this last year, share how he regrets letting your six years together implode so unceremoniously. At the exact right moment in this conversation, the moment Nora Ephron would script, Clementine will perk her ears, pull forward from your arms, and lick his cheek. He will laugh, doing that side smile that makes the dimple on his left cheek come out. He will take a fistful of your sweater to pull you in for a kiss. Clementine will bark, twice. Nicholas will make a joke about how she's jealous. You'll both laugh, kiss again, and now Clementine will give in and just rest her chin on his shoulder. Update, adoption pending. Leroy. Male, Shih Tzu, 12 weeks old. Leroy might only be a puppy, but he's already the leader of the pack in his litter, and he will bring the same MO to your home, too. Leroy will take no shit, and you will respect this about him. You'll try to be more like Leroy, and you'll like how it feels. But unfortunately, Leroy will also take no shit from you, nor allow any men anywhere near you. He may only grow to be 15 pounds, but it will be 15 pounds of unrelenting tyranny. Matzo and Macaroon, females, hound mixes, two years old, bonded, must be adopted as a pair. Matzo and Macaroon will make you feel things, and not just deep primal shame about what happened at last year's Passover. They will make you feel joy, hope, like maybe, with Matzo and Macaroon, next year's Seder will be different, better. With this pair of hounds, you will finally wake up and go running again in the mornings. You'll go on long scenic walks, You'll actually wear those hiking boots you impulsively bought from the REI semi-annual sale, not just move them from room to room every month or so, still in the box. You will be awash in endorphins. Zeus, male Australian cattle dog, three years old. With Zeus as your dog, you will quickly and rapturously fall in love again. Each morning, over coffee and farmer's market berries, you and your new love will do the New York Times crossword puzzle, individually, but together. You will solve for your final words at the same moment, triumphantly, and with no competitive banter having, over the years, turned into a stiff, icy, deeply rooted grudge. You will look up at each other, beam, and clink your coffee cups. Zeus will know this means it's time for his walk, 
and will bark once in anticipation. You will both walk him hand in hand, happy for the time together, not use the opportunity to pick a fight over who does more of what for the collective. Tuba, male, Burmese mountain dog, eight months old. Tuba's foster family admits he's a large presence, but his goofy, affable demeanor more than makes up for the fur and drool he lives, leaves in his wake around the house. Tuba is accepting of his flaws, and he knows that a big one, the drooling, is part of his charm. Tuba will make you more confident. Tuba will dance his way around the neighborhood, and no one will ever begrudge you the space you and Tuba take up together. Potato, female, black lab mix, nine years old. Potato will assure you that preferring to spend as many waking hours as possible on the couch for which she was named is not a failure. She will, in fact, encourage you to embrace even more time there. She'll be your 60 pound pillow, weighted blanket, and excuse to stay home all in one. Potato will never judge you. Rut row, you've reached the end of the search results. Besides Liz, you've been staying on the pullout sofa in Caroline's home office going on two months now. Might we suggest you go see what Zillow has to offer you instead? That's all. Oh, and I am extremely happy always to uh, bring up to the stage B. Troxel, who hopefully you also were able to see perform last night at the French House. If I can collect my things. I had a wild thought that what if I got up here and just played a sonata with these <laughs> glasses of water? Okay. I'm gonna, oh yeah, it really hits you when you get up here. Um, okay, I'm gonna read two little pieces. One uh, is, last year I read part of a piece um, that I had really just started uh, about, um, about uh, high school, uh, I, okay, it really just, okay, I'm ready. Um, thank you, Glenn, Adam, and Leah for having me back. Uh, thank you, staff, for being so wonderful, and thank you to the faculty and participants. It is truly a treat to be here. Um, so, this is the second part of an essay that I started reading last year and finished over the last year. And it's about um, teaching at my alma mater, which was a pretty conservative high school in Tennessee, uh, Presbyterian. The school is called CPA. Before starting the job, I had kind of just figured out I was queer and also was like, I won't be dating anyone, and then started dating someone. Um, so I'm just gonna start in the middle of that. Here's what I will tell you about the students. They were special. I had a group of ninth grade girls who would stand around my desk and gossip and chat before school started. One of them would ask for book recommendations and then never read them. They left me notes, Miss B is the bay. Some would recommend songs. One student would sit and play Billie Eilish covers with me after school while the other students quietly did work in the library. I once watched a freshman boy run around the library dancing to Shakira when only one other student was in the room, glancing at me every few seconds as if challenging me to stop his wild behavior, but I never did. Needless to say, I loved these kids. They were silly and smart and goofy and shy. I posted a new poem each, each week on my desk, which only one student ever read. I ordered covertly secular novels into the library, and I snuck out two titles, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, and I Kissed Dating Goodbye. There were a handful of students who would walk into my room and say things such as, I don't think there's anything wrong with being gay, or my friend is gay and I don't think that's a problem, while walking past my desk. They must have had some sense that I was a safe person. Every Friday during lunch, the female faculty converted the library into a Bible study room. Bibles and notebooks fluttered throughout the room as women chatted and discussed the radical role of women in the Bible. During these lunches, I would develop these intense headaches. Old thoughts that I used to have in high school began to pop up, ones in which I would doubt my view of the world because I thought I should feel God's presence. The way they talked about God at CPA made me think that if I just lived a little purer, 
If I tried just a little bit harder, then I might feel that presence. I spent so much time in high school not feeling connected to God or the Bible, and so I had to learn to trust others' perceptions over my own. When you learn to trust others over yourself from a young age, it takes a long time to learn what your own thoughts are. I found this sensation returning when I became a teacher at this school. I found myself looking to others for what to do and what to believe. It happened when the Bible teacher would come up to my desk and ask where I went to church, and when he heard I was Anglican, he would invite me to his Baptist church. Once a week, he'd let me know what time his service started on Sundays. It took all of my people-pleasing body to not attend and not fear that he had some divine knowledge that I did not. It happened when teachers spoke to me of their fears for the students going into the real world. It happened whenever we had our weekly chapels filing into the giant sanctuary with dim lighting and a conservative speaker. The worldview that the school had created, that the school held, created a space where I doubted myself because I never felt that connection to God or that understanding of divinity that everyone else talked about. Rather than trusting that absence, I doubted it. My mom often told me that I seemed to have more of a connection with God than anyone she knew. I always protested because I felt so much doubt, but I still did not want to let down the people in my life who saw something bigger than me. I think she implied I had a connection to the sacred things in the world, but this was again a moment of seeing something in me that I could not understand for myself. Others seeing God in me where I did not continued to separate me from my body, my perception of self, and I longed for praise from others about virtues I felt as if I could not control. While I was working at CPA, during walks with my girlfriend C through my neighborhood, I would get nervous about students seeing us and outing me to the school. In my first week as librarian, I went to a show with her in a small venue in town. We were holding hands in the back, pressed against each other, while we listened to a blonde Nashville musician. The next day at school, one of the literature teachers came up to me in the library. He was known for teaching the AP language class with a strong social justice bent. But he walked in and said, hey, I saw you at the show last night. We both paused and looked at each other, and then he said, I'm glad you're here. What he meant, and what I asked him about months later, was that he was glad someone like me, someone queer, was in a place like this, a Presbyterian school. Within the school, I had support. A handful of teachers I could talk to who affirmed me, who met my partner. This was the secret of love and support, the secret web of love and support that I found at the school. There is a power in secrets. There is a power in holding the cards. There is a power in knowing that you're not fully a part of a place. It's a power that relies on you feeling separate, not revealing the truth for as long as you can. I have found this power held within me when I'm in friendships, relationships, and communities. If I have one foot out the door, I have the power because I can't get hurt. I wonder if partially, subconsciously, I put myself at CPA because I knew I wasn't always gonna be there. There was no fear of rejection because I knew the rejection would already occur by me. It was set up to happen. The fact that I kept that post-it note proclivity over my desk for so long was a reminder of what made me different. I've always thought I kept it there to remind me of what I do not believe, but I wonder if it's the pain I can't let go of, the difficulty and safety of being separate. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm at the reading right now, but, um, <laughs> Ananda, uh, inspi yeah, I'm going to read the essay that Ananda told me to write that's about the red phone. Yeah, um, and, and, and just a little bit of it, and just kind of about why I became obsessed with a toy. It's pretty confusing. Okay, yeah, I'll call you back later. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, just a itty bit. I walked inside the brick bungalow with mahogany tables and warm yellow light, and Ada, 11 years old, ran up and said, it's from an Arby spy kit. I asked what she was talking about, that phone you bought yesterday. It should have a secret hiding spot inside of it. I pulled out the plastic cell phone from my pocket. It was red with a glow-in-the-dark green antenna sticking out of the top. On the face of the phone was a message that said, meet me later, where the screen of the phone should be. <laughs> Ada toyed with the antenna on top and the cell phone swung open, revealing a hollow middle. We spent a few minutes filling it with all of my loose change. 
The evening after I found the red phone, I played a show with two of my friends, and we took turns passing it around, putting people on hold and asking who was calling. I'd cup the bottom of my phone with my palm as I leaned to my friend, who's calling again? She'd whisper, oh, it's Judy. She needs something urgent. And then I'd talk to Judy about whatever thing had become so important. Boundaries, I'd often shout into the phone. <laughs> hmm. Later that week, I got into my car to go somewhere, and I looked down and had only brought my red phone, not my actual phone that made actual <laughs> phone calls. I had tucked the red phone into my spandex rather than tucking in my iPhone. This happened one other time at 2 a.m. at a writer's conference. Walking back to my dorm room, I realized I had to wake up for a hike at 6 a.m. the next morning, and luckily I had an alarm clock because my iPhone was long left behind at the bar, and clutched in my fist was a red phone. <laughs> Sometimes we rescue ourselves, and we don't even know we're doing it. Silly is the holiest of all states, my friend tells me on the phone. I believe that my ability to play reflects my relationships in life. My friends are all yes-anders. My friends all respond to what the Gottmans call bids for connection. The red phone was my space of play and my bid for connection at home. Every time I handed it to someone, I was asking them to play with me, and I needed low-stakes way for people to say yes and yes and yes and yes. Thank you.